Thank you for having me. My name is Natalie Denberg, and my talk is entitled Financial Exploitation in Aging and Dementia. I am a clinical neuropsychologist and assistant professor in the Department of Neurology. My professional time is split between clinical neuropsychological work and research, both with older adults. My main research interests involve the cognitive neuroscience of aging, particularly related to why older adults fall prey to fraud. I have no financial relationships to disclose. The objectives for today's presentation are, one, to discuss why older adults are at risk for financial exploitation, two, to describe the financial abilities of the typical older adult, three, to list methods for identifying individuals with dementia who are at risk for financial exploitation, and four, to list methods for identifying seemingly healthy older adults who are at risk for financial exploitation. I'd like to say from the outset that in spite of financial abilities being crucial to everyday living and independence, there has been a surprising lack of conceptual and empirical study of financial exploitation, financial decision making, and the like. Because I research this understudied topic, I will be presenting quite a bit of my own work. At one time, Mickey Rooney was the most well-recognized actor in the world. However, at the age of 90, Rooney was the alleged victim of financial, verbal, and emotional abuse at the hands of his stepson. He alleges that his stepson defrauded him of millions of dollars. Ultimately, control of his finances were handed over to his lawyer and a restraining order against his stepson was granted. He brought his personal story of elder abuse before the Senate Special Committee on Aging in 2011 in an effort to draw attention to the widely underreported problem of elder abuse. Unprecedented changes are occurring worldwide as the population ages. To give just a few impressive examples, there are 1.2 billion older people projected worldwide by the year 2025, and 70% of these elders will be residing in developing countries. There is a net increase of 1 million persons 60 years of age and older worldwide with every passing month. The first of 77 million U.S. baby boomers, that is those who were born in 1946, turned 65 in 2011. The last wave, born in 1964, will hit that mark in 2030 when one out of every five Americans will be 65 years of age and older. Finally, 10,000 new persons will qualify for Medicare every day for the next 17 years. In addition to those impressive statistics, the potential for financial exploitation of the elderly is made worse by the fact that deceptive and fraudulent advertisers, telemarketers, and door-to-door -door salespeople are notorious for targeting older adults. Stories of vulnerable older adults losing their life savings and their sense of dignity shock and sadden us. To illustrate using some recent exploitation statistics, a 2010 study by Investor Protection Trust reported that 20% of Americans age 65 and older have been taken advantage of financially. And a 2011 MetLife study estimated that elderly victims lose approximately $3 billion annually from fraud, a value that is up 12% from 2008. 
Finally, not only are we experiencing global aging and seeing more and more elders duped out of their money, there also exists poor financial literacy. In 2012, the National Financial Capability Study was conducted, which studied the financial capabilities of 25,000 adult Americans of all ages. Study participants were asked five questions covering fundamental aspects of economics and finance encountered in daily life. I'll now take you through the five questions. Number one, suppose you have $100 in a savings account, earning 2% interest a year. After five years, how much would you have? Take a moment to think about your answer. The answer is A, more than $102. Number two, imagine that the interest rate on your savings account is 1% a year and inflation is 2% a year. After one year, would the money in the account buy more than it does today, exactly the same, or less than today? Take a moment to think about your answer. The answer is C, less than today. Number three, if interest rates rise, what will typically happen to bond prices? Rise, fall, stay the same, or there is no relationship? Take a moment to think about your answer. The answer is B, fall. A 15-year mortgage typically requires higher monthly payments than a 30-year mortgage, but the total interest over the life of the loan will be less. True or false? Take a moment to think about your answer. The answer is A, true. Number five. Buying a single company stock usually provides a safer return than a stock mutual fund. True or false? The answer is B, false. So how did you do? The national mean is approximately 2.9 out of 5. The Iowa mean is slightly higher at 3 out of 5. In our own research using older adults in the greater Iowa City area, our mean is higher. It's about three and a half out of five. I'd like to note that of the 25,000 respondents to this survey, only 14% answered all five questions correctly, and just 39% answered four out of the five questions correctly. Not surprisingly, certain demographics predicted stronger quiz scores. Those demographics were being male, being older, being white or Asian, and having a higher educational level. I'd now like to talk about how patients with dementia and the precursor, mild cognitive impairment, perform on everyday financial tasks. As you might guess, they do not perform well, which is why it is critical that we identify these individuals and assign them legal protection. I'll give you a moment to take a look at this schematic. On the y-axis, we have overall financial capacity from low or none to the maximum financial capacity possible. And along this x-axis, we have disease progression. So normal aging here, going into mild cognitive impairment, then converting to mild Alzheimer's disease, moderate Alzheimer's disease, and severe Alzheimer's disease. And this is a conceptual schematic. So Wadera and colleagues show how financial capacity, and please think in terms of the clinical and not legal term, how financial capacity changes from normal aging 
to mild cognitive impairment to the different stages of Alzheimer's disease. The figure indicates that financial capacity should steadily decline with the progression of cognitive deficits. There are very few well-validated measures of financial capacity for individuals with mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Probably the best measure available for neurological patients is Daniel Marson and colleagues' financial capacity instrument, and I'll be referring to it as the FCI. The FCI is a standardized, psychometric, performance-based, technician-administered instrument based on their tripartite model. Their tripartite model views financial abilities as requiring one, basic declarative knowledge, such as having knowledge about currency, two, procedural knowledge, for example, knowing how to write a check, and three, higher order judgment or the ability to evaluate novel or ambiguous situations and make financial decisions in one's best interest. As you can see, there are six domains with several tasks under each domain. The FCI items range from testing more basic skills such as counting coins and making a one item grocery purchase to more complex skills such as managing a bank statement and preparing a bill for mailing. The table I am showing you is from the original version of the FCI, which is called the FCI 6, referring to the six domains. There is now an FCI 9 with nine domains. Administration time for the FCI 9 is approximately one hour or a little more with clinical populations. In 2000, Marson and colleagues published the first empirical study of financial capacity in patients with Alzheimer's disease. In this study, the FCI 6 was administered to 23 normal non-neurologic older adults, and they refer to them as controls. It was also administered to 30 patients with mild Alzheimer's disease, referred to here as mild AD, and then 20 individuals diagnosed with moderate AD. Let me give you a moment to take a look at this table. Here we have the domains for the FCI 6. We have the score range from zero to the maximum scores. And then we have the data for the three groups, controls, mild AD, and moderate AD. Now let's first take the comparison of controls versus the mild AD group. The mild AD patients performed equivalently to the control group in a single domain. That was domain one, which is the basic monetary skills domain. But for all the other domains, the mild AD group performed significantly below the controls. When we compare the moderate AD group to both the control group and their mild AD counterparts, the moderate AD group performs significantly worse than both of those groups in all six domains. I'd like to point out that the control group in this table demonstrated close to a ceiling effect. That is, they do particularly well on this performance-based task. Financial capacity has also been investigated in patients with mild cognitive impairment. In this longitudinal study, change in financial capacity was assessed between three groups. One, cognitively healthy older adults, referred to as controlled. MCI patients who converted 
to Alzheimer's disease. Those are referred to as the MCI converters. And then finally, MCI patients who did not convert to Alzheimer's disease, named MCI non-converters. So again, we have three groups. We have controls. We have the MCA non-converters who did not convert. And then we have the MCI converters who did convert over the course of a year. In panel A, we have the total FCI score, the total score for the FCI. And in panel B, we've pulled out just domain four, which is checkbook management. I'd like you to first take a look at baseline in both figures. Baseline here for total score and baseline here for domain four. And you'll notice that the groups significantly differ from one another. The controls outperform the MCI non-converters who outperform the MCI converters. And we have that here too. After a one-year lag, the controls and the MCI non-converters are relatively stable, as you can see from these flat lines, a line with no slope. While the MCI converters showed significant declines, particularly in procedural skills, such as calculating the correct balance in the checkbook register, and this occurred despite intact conceptual understanding of checkbook management. So to repeat that, it's interesting that for the MCI converters, for domain four, they showed a significant drop from baseline to the year one follow-up in terms of their procedural scores. And this is in the context of good conceptual understanding of what they needed to do. Dr. Bob Rausch and his colleagues at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston created an educational program entitled IFE, or Elder Investment Fraud and Financial Exploitation Prevention Program. It consists of an hour-long PowerPoint presentation, and importantly, it has culminated in the creation of two types of prevention materials that we'll be talking about in a moment. During this past summer, IFE was presented in Iowa for the first time at the Mary Greeley Medical Center in Ames. On this slide are the IFE collaborators. I'd like to highlight the primary funding source, which is Investor Protection Trust. One of the prevention materials is called the Clinician's Pocket Guide, which is simply a series of questions to guide one's clinical assessment of older adults' vulnerability to financial exploitation. As the name suggests, this can be placed in your pocket so it is readily accessible when interviewing older adults and their family members. Essentially, it is a list of environmental, patient, in observational variables that may put one at increased risk for financial exploitation. There is also a patient education brochure shown here on the right side of the slide for patients and family members to take home with them that further discusses the financial exploitation of elders. Both of these materials can be obtained by contacting Investor Protection Trust or can be downloaded from their website. Now let's turn to normal aging. Unfortunately, as you'll see, even healthy older adults are at risk for financial exploitation. It is important to step back and consider the developmental challenges of older adulthood. I would submit to you that older adulthood is the period in the life course when some of the most critical and complex decisions need to be made. To name but a few, older adults must make complex medical decisions, such as treatment decisions regarding cancer and heart disease. Financial decisions, such as planning for retirement, 
and purchasing financial products such as stocks. Estate planning. When widowed, taking over the roles and responsibilities of the deceased spouse. And finally, changes to one's living environment. For all these decisions, the chance for exploitation exists. We do not wholly understand why the elderly are vulnerable to being swindled. Although possible explanations range from loneliness and gullibility to memory impairment and dementia, these characteristics do not accurately describe many of the victims. For example, many older adults have provided cogent congressional testimony in which their ability to describe their experiences with multiple scams does not give any evidence of cognitive loss, memory impairment, or generalized dementia. Instead, from our own data, much of which I'll be presenting to you today, we propose that cognitive vulnerability, though not a bona fide dementia, specifically related to flawed emotional responses that stem from abnormalities that develop in the brain's prefrontal cortex may help explain why older adults are frequently victims of elder fraud. Now before I get into some of these empirical studies, I would like to highlight two theories that have guided much of this work. So there are many theories on how a healthy, quote unquote, brain ages. Some of these ideas contradict conventional wisdom, which holds that aging is synonymous with memory loss. Although human memory does tend to deteriorate modestly with age, many older people experience far more dramatic declines in cognitive abilities that are not related to memory, such as concentration, problem solving, and decision making changes, abilities that are closely associated with the frontal lobes of the brain. A recent theory called the frontal lobe hypothesis of cognitive aging proposes that older people have disproportionate age-related changes of frontal lobe structures and the cognitive abilities associated with those structures. Data indicate that the frontal lobes undergo greater age-related declines than the temporal lobes in head-to-head -head studies examining both brain structures. And this support comes from diverse sources, including structural brain imaging, functional brain imaging, neuron density studies, cerebral blood flow studies, and electrophysiologic and neuropsychological studies. In addition to the frontal lobe hypothesis, another guiding theoretical framework is the somatic marker hypothesis developed at Iowa by Dr. Antonio Damasio, that the gist of which is how emotion is essential for advantageous decision making. In terms of a crash course on the somatic marker hypothesis, perhaps an example is best. You are walking home alone at night and you consider taking a shortcut down an alley to minimize the length of time it takes to get home. However, just prior to turning down this alley, your stomach turns over and feels kind of funny or queasy, suggesting that you have some apprehension. It is exactly this type of bodily feedback that shapes our decisions in hopefully advantageous ways. That is, bodily feedback is essential to helping us make advantageous choices. I'll let you read the remainder of this slide on your own. To test the somatic marker hypothesis, we needed a decision-making test that brought emotion prominently into the cognitive process. The standard tests of executive functioning, such as trail making, part B, and the Wisconsin card sorting tests did not bring emotion into the equation. 
And therefore, the Iowa Gambling Task was created by Antoine Bashara, Hannah Damasio, and Antonio Damasio in the early 1990s. Here we have our research assistant, Lindsay, taking the Iowa Gambling Task. As you can see, it's administered on a computer. You'll also notice that she has two electrodes on each of the palms of her hands, and that's to measure skin conductance, which is our best way of measuring somatic markers. And finally, she completes the task with the use of a mouse. Here is what the monitor was showing Lindsay. This is the Iowa Gambling Task. In this task, the goal is to maximize monetary gains while minimizing losses. And the participants are explicitly told that. The participant is given a loan of $2,000 in computer money to gamble with, which is represented by this red bar. Participants are presented with four decks of cards labeled A, B, C, and D, and they are asked to choose one card at a time. They don't realize that there will be 100 choices in total. Each time they select a card, they are rewarded with computer money and their cash pile, this yellow bar, grows. However, on some card picks, the participant is also penalized by taking away some of the computer money. In these cases, their choice was initially rewarded, but then they were also punished through the loss of some monetary amount. This game has been rigged so that there are two decks which have a high payoff, but even higher penalties. We call these the high reward, high risk decks, and we also refer to them as the bad decks. The other two decks are rigged to have low rewards, but even lower penalties, and we call these the low reward, low risk decks, or the good decks. Let me show you an example of a selection from a bad deck. I choose either A or B. I win $100, but I subsequently lose a larger amount of $1,250. And this is an extreme example of what you might see from a choice from the bad decks. Here is an example of a selection from a good deck. You choose either C or D. There is an initial reward of $50, but a smaller subsequent loss of $25 resulting in a net gain. Across all 100 trials, more choices from the good decks lead to a net gain, while choosing from the bad decks leads to a net loss. The participants are instructed that the goal of the game is to win as much money as possible. Here I have plotted findings from the Iowa Gambling Task in two groups of older adults. Let me explain the graph to you. Along this y-axis, we have the net advantageous choices of the subjects. That is the number of choices from the good decks, C and D, minus the number of choices from the bad decks, A and B. Along this x-axis, we have the 100 card choices broken down into five blocks of 20 selections each. Across several different samples of older adults, we have repeatedly found that about one quarter to one third of seemingly healthy older adults perform the task the way neurological patients with damage to their ventral medial prefrontal cortex do. Both exhibit a preference for choices that lead to high immediate reward, but greater long-term punishment. And we call this group the impaired group. By contrast, another quarter to a third of seemingly healthy older adults exhibit what we call risk aversiveness and they tend to select predominantly from the good decks. We call this group the unimpaired decision makers. So let me take you through this graph. In the first 20 card choices, people tend to pick more from the bad decks than the good decks. And you can see that my older unimpaired and older impaired groups start um, 
start the same as one another. They're not reliably different. However, as the task progresses, we see a divergence of the two groups. The solid line is the older unimpaired. The dotted line is the older impaired. And you can see how the older unimpaired show a clear preference for the good decks. By decks four and five, they're choosing almost exclusively from the good decks and the bad decks. And then we see how the older impaired show a preference for the bad decks over the good decks. To give you some perspective, I will superimpose the graphs of performance for young adults and a group of neurological patients with damage to their ventromedial prefrontal cortex. As you can see, the older unimpaired group is at least as good as the normal healthy younger adults that I've shown here in red. And as you can see, the impaired older adults are at least as bad, if not worse, than the ventromedial prefrontal cortex patient group shown in blue. The remainder of the talk today will deal with our ongoing efforts to distinguish these two groups of seemingly healthy older adults, older impaired and older unimpaired. Our participants have been tested on an array of neuropsychological tests to ensure they are cognitively intact. They have also had their medical charts carefully evaluated to address their health status and their level of medical comorbidity. Other variables of interest include self-described risk-taking behavior and mood and personality. And all of these variables are listed here in the first column. As you can see, as indicated in the red box, older unimpaired and older impaired groups of subjects, and this is as measured by the Iowa Gambling Task, NS were non-significant from one another on all of these variables. There have been two variables, however, that have discriminated between the groups. One is self-described trait neuroticism, and the other is the Iowa Scales of Personality Change, and I'll go through those one at a time. Here's a figure from our 2009 paper. Again, on the y-axis, we have Iowa Gambling Task Performance with higher scores indicating more advantageous or good deck picks. And on the x-axis, we have the 100 deck picks broken down into blocks of 20 picks each. Here, we show an interaction. The interaction is between Iowa Gambling Task Performance in older adults and trait neuroticism whereby older adults with high trait neuroticism perform the most poorly on the Iowa Gambling Task. And you can see that as indicated by this bottom group that deviates from the other three groups. By contrast, there was no relationship between trait neuroticism and Iowa Gambling Task performance among younger adults. A very recent finding that I'm particularly excited and intrigued by is on the right side of this slide, and it's a paper by Chris Nguyen, a graduate student of mine, and um, our colleagues. Here again, we emphasize the older impaired and older unimpaired participants, and we asked a collateral to complete uh, an instrument called the Iowa Scales of Personality Change. The Iowa Scales was actually developed to be used in patients who have had a stroke and their loved ones would, would rate them before the stroke versus after the stroke? Well, because there's no insult or injury in our older adults, we adapted this instrument to be developmental in nature. And we asked loved ones to rate our older participants on these 30 personality variables as to how they were in their middle-aged years, in their 30s and 40s, versus how they were today, which is roughly in their 70s and 80s. And what we found was that older impaired and older unimpaired participants differed in personality disturbances of the executive type. So the collaterals of the older impaired participants endorsed significantly more often a lack of planning 
poor judgment, a lack of persistence, greater perseveration, a lack of initiative, greater impulsivity, and great, greater indecisiveness among the older impaired versus older unimpaired participants. This slide is a different way of depicting the Iowa scale data that I just presented to you. Um, the pie chart is showing you the significant predictors of Iowa gambling task performance. And you can see that long-standing executive personality deficits accounted for the greatest amount of variance, and that's shown in this light blue. The next most important predictor of decision-making performance on the Iowa gambling task was self-reported depression. Next, we had two neuropsychological variables that were predictive, and that's matrix reasoning, which is a nonverbal abstraction reasoning test, and then finally, Wisconsin card sorting performance, which is a, an executive functioning problem solving task. Okay, now I'm going to turn to the psychophysiological studies. I'd like you to think back to the woman sitting at the computer completing the Iowa gambling task. Recall that she had electrodes on the palms of her hands. That's so that we can measure her skin conductance response, or SCR. And SCR for us is a proxy for somatic markers. There are many different types of SCRs that we collect in the Iowa gambling task, but I'd like to concentrate on something called anticipatory SCRs. And these are defined as SCRs that are generated immediately prior to the point at which the subject turns a card from decks A, B, C, or D. That is, it's during the time period that the subject is pondering which deck to choose. This graph shows the anticipatory skin conductors response during playing of the Iowa gambling task for younger adults in panel A, and patients with acquired lesions to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex of the brain in panel B. On the y-axis, we have the magnitude of skin conductance response, which is also referred to as area under the curve. And on the x-axis, we have progression through the 100 card choices of the Iowa gambling task. As you can see, healthy young participants show quite a bit of skin conductance activity. And they tend to show the greatest anticipatory skin conductance response just prior to choosing from a bad deck, the open and closed circles, decks A and B. I'm going to repeat that again. In healthy, young, and middle-aged normal controls, they show the greatest anticipatory skin conductance response just prior to a bad deck pick, decks A and B. By contrast, they have relatively smaller SCR responses prior to the good deck choices, decks C and D. Now let's look at the patient group, panel B. They show very low magnitude, non-discriminating SCR responses to all the decks suggesting a lack of anticipatory skin conductance response that is, we believe, helpful in shaping younger and middle-aged decisions in an advantageous direction. On this slide, we have the older adult findings. Again, the older unimpaired versus the older impaired. Like before on the y-axis, we have the degree of skin conductance response. And on the x-axis, this time we have older impaired grouped here and older impaired grouped to the right. The black bars represent the advantageous deck picks, and the gray bars represent the disadvantageous deck picks. Let me give you a moment to take in what you're seeing. Let's start with the older impaired group. As you can see, it's very flat here. The older and pair participants fail to generate what we call discriminatory anticipatory skin conductance responses during the Iowa gambling task. And perhaps this is part of the reason why they do so poorly on the task. 
they're receiving no differential bodily feedback as to what deck might be good and what deck might be bad. By contrast, there is discrimination among the older unimpaired participants at a significant level where they're showing greater skin conductance response to the good decks versus the bad. Now, for those of you who have been really listening, you might say that's, that's wrong. That's exactly opposite what I just showed you with the younger adults, and that's true. This is the exact opposite pattern we saw in younger adults. We interpreted these findings as suggesting that strong decision-making abilities among older adults appears to be a function of a positive rather than negative somatic marker. So there's more emphasis on the positive than the negative. And this is actually in line with quite a bit of developmental research, um, for example, by Laura Karstensen and colleagues at Stanford University. She has a theory called socio-emotional selectivity theory, which shows that older adults have a real positivity bias and that this positivity bias increases with age. Now I'd like to turn to real-world decision-making. Before you, we have eight of the stimuli from our real-world task called consumer decision-making. This task uses stimuli that the Federal Trade Commission has deemed deceptive or misleading. From their descriptions of the advertisements we created with a professional advertising executive, our own advertisements. We create a deceptive version that mimics exactly what was wrong with the advertisement, and then we create a non-deceptive counterpart. So for each of the ads, there's a deceptive and non-deceptive counterpart. Let me take you through a few of these. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the pill ad. The manipulation involves disclosure that you must modify your diet and increase your exercise when using the pill versus no disclosure. Next to that, the healthy bread ad. The manipulation involves disclosure that calcium-rich bread will not help your memory versus no disclosure. The down comforter ad. The manipulation involves disclosure of the actual content of the comforter versus no disclosure. And then finally, the luggage ad. The manipulation involves disclosure that luggage is made in Mexico and not the United States versus no disclosure. So again, these advertisements were created with help from the Federal Trade Commission using their data on which advertisements were deemed deceptive or fraudulent. We work with an expert in advertising and create our own advertisements. One version is misleading or deceptive and the other has the missing information included. We next take the advertisements that I just showed you and we use them in something called the consumer decision-making task. In this task, we create a booklet of advertisements, eight advertisements, four that are deceptive and four that are non-deceptive, and we present those to the participants. We present it to them in what we call an incidental fashion. We say we'd like you to read through this booklet of advertisements. These advertisements have been shown in popular magazines such as Sports Illustrated in the last couple of years. Take whatever time you want to look through these advertisements, but look at them well enough that you could give us your opinion about these advertisements when you're done. And we let people take whatever time they want. Typically, people take close to 10 minutes to look through this booklet. When they're done looking through the booklet, incidental or unbeknownst to them, we then give them a post-test. And in this written post-test, we're interested in assessing both their comprehension of the advertisement's claims and also their purchase intentions, meaning how interested are they in purchasing the particular item. And let me show you the data for that. First, I want to point out that we have three groups of subjects, and you've already heard about these three groups several times. We have younger adults. By the way, these are people roughly 26 to 40. They're not college students, and they've all performed advantageously on the Iowa gambling task or in an unimpaired fashion. Then we have our two groups of older adults, older unimpaired and older impaired. And the solid line are the younger adults, 
the circle dotted line are the older unimpaired and the triangle dotted line are the older impaired. On the x-axis, we have the two dependent variables, comprehension, how well they comprehended the ad, and then purchase intentions to the right. On the x-axis, and this may be a little confusing, so just hang in there with me a moment, we have a full disclosure condition. This is the non-deceptive ads that were seen. And then a limited disclosure condition. That's the deceptive or misleading ads. So recall that everybody received a mixture of deceptive and non-deceptive ads, but they never saw the same ad in both the deceptive and non-deceptive form. So let's look at the full disclosure condition for both of these graphs. What you should take away from that is that the three groups did not differ. When you provide the participant with all of the details, there's nothing hidden, there's nothing misleading, comprehension of claims among the younger, the older unimpaired, and the older impaired are not reliably different. That's great news. Same thing for purchase intentions. My error bar dropped here, but these three groups are overlapping. You'll have to trust me. In the full disclosure condition, younger, older unimpaired, and older impaired show the same degree of interest or desire to purchase the product. Now look what happens when we move to the deceptive or misleading ad called limited disclosure here. Something pretty radical happens and it's exactly what the fraudulent and deceptive telemarketers and salespeople hope will happen. For comprehension, one group's comprehension drops significantly and one group's purchase intentions rise significantly and that's exactly what these corrupt individuals want. They want you to poorly comprehend what you're reading or seeing or hearing and they want you to really desire the product and want to purchase it. And what group is that that it happened to? That's the individuals who were impaired on the Iowa gambling task. The next study I'd like to highlight is our financial decision-making study. The study was conducted by now veterinarian student Sarah Shivapur. Here we explored how 102 younger adults versus 116 older adults made a series of increasingly complex financial decisions. This is admittedly a very complex study, and I can't do it justice today in the time that's allowed, but I would like to highlight several of the findings. In terms of pre-existing financial knowledge, older adults outperformed younger adults. This makes quite a bit of sense with life experiences. Older adults had greater financial knowledge than their younger counterparts. And we took that into account in any further analyses. We used existing financial knowledge as a covariate. So let me highlight four of the findings. First, older adults were more likely to make immediate investment decisions, whereas younger adults exhibited a preference for delaying decision making pending additional information. Second, older adults rated themselves as being more concerned with avoiding monetary loss. They showed a prevention orientation, while younger adults reported greater interest in financial gain or demonstrated a promotion orientation. Among just the older adults, performance on the four scenarios was predicted by a couple of neuropsychological tasks. And those tasks are shown on the right side of this graph. And they were measures of nonverbal reasoning, block design, and matrix reasoning from the Wexler scales, and also measures of executive functioning predicted the quality of the financial decision making, such tasks as Wisconsin card sorting, trail making part B, and the Iowa gambling task. I would note that we did not find that numerical skill, performance on the Wexler arithmetic subtest, or performance on the difficult task called Lipkus's numeracy scale, those two tasks were not predictive of performance on the financial decision-making scenarios. And this runs counter to quite a bit of what 
Daniel Marson has found. At least in patients with dementia, mathematical or numerical skill was predictive of performance on his financial capacity instrument. Our next step in contrasting the older impaired decision makers to the older unimpaired decision makers was to look at the integrity of their brains. And we did this through a structural neuroimaging study and also through a functional neuroimaging study where we used resting positron emission tomography. As I've talked about these two groups, I imagine that many of you might wonder whether the older impaired group were in a prodrome or preclinical stage of Alzheimer's disease. And that's a very good hypothesis that perhaps they're not ill enough to be showing the types of neuropsychological deficits we'd expect, but that give them another five years and these older impaired decision makers would look very much like a patient with mild Alzheimer's disease. So from a structural neuroimaging and a PET perspective, we might expect to see differences in temporal parietal brain regions. There's another hypothesis, though, that was more important to us, and it's the first bullet point, that we anticipated that the two groups would differ in their prefrontal cortex, and particularly in the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, based on all of the work that we've done with focal lesion patients. So those are our two hypotheses moving into the neuroimaging data. Could this be early prodrome of Alzheimer's disease where we're gonna see differences in medial temporal lobe brain structures or even temporal parietal as shown by the PET data? Or is this more of a frontal lobe phenomenon? On the top portion of this slide, I have the FTG PET results and on the bottom portion, I have the structural MRI results. Recall from the previous slide, the gist of this is to contrast medial temporal lobe brain structures with more anterior brain structures. And what we found was consistent with what we hypothesized that the older impaired versus the older unimpaired group differ in, in anterior brain regions and not medial temporal lobe brain regions. So let's take the FTG PET first. This was resting fluorodeoxyglucose positron emission tomography. We injected a radioactive tracer into these older adults uh, via IV after a period of fasting. There was an uptake period and then we measured the resting metabolism as a result of this radioactive tracer. And we found group differences basically in anterior brain regions. Let me highlight a few of these. Ventral medial prefrontal cortex and dorsal medial prefrontal cortex which are important to decision making Insular cortex in the right hemisphere, which is important to emotional states. And then bilaterally, inferior frontal gyrus and caudate, which are important for executive functioning. So in all these regions, there was lower metabolism, less metabolism among the older impaired versus older unimpaired. There were no group differences in any more posterior brain structures, including the medial temporal lobe brain structures. Down below, looking at the structural MRI findings, our main measure here was a measure of cortical thickness, and that correlates very highly with volumetric measures. And we found more cortical thinning among the older impaired versus older unimpaired adults. And that was in the region of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. Again, both of these being consistent with our hypothesis. So this brings us to the question of what can we do? What can we do to protect our patients, our clients, our friends and family from financial exploitation? Well, at the most simple level, we can ask questions. We can ask questions of our patients, our clients, and our collaterals along the lines we talked about. We could look to see whether there's executive personality deficits. We could use our pocket guide created by IFE to see whether there's environmental or other risk factors that put them in harm's way for financial exploitation. We could use neuropsychological assessment as several tasks, typically non-memory tasks, have been useful in identifying those at risk for falling prey to deceptive and fraudulent tactics. In particular, Measures of nonverbal intellect, such as matrix reasoning and block design from the Wexler scales have been useful, and also measures of executive functioning, including the Iowa gambling task. 
Trail Making Part B, and the Wisconsin Card Sorting Test. Finally, validated instruments do exist for examining financial capacity in neurologic populations, such as Dan Marson's Financial Capacity Instrument. I'd like to end by acknowledging several people who have contributed to the work presented today. I'd like to thank Dr. Bob Wallace in University of Iowa's Department of Epidemiology. He's been a mentor of mine. My collaborator, William Hedgecock in the UI Department of Marketing. Dr. Daniel Trinnell, also in the UI Department of Neurology. And my colleague, Antoine Bashara, who is now in the Department of Psychology at the University of Southern California. I'd like to also acknowledge several graduate and professional students, Christopher Nguyen, Gina Moreno, Kimiko Hoffman, Brian Kessner, and Lindsay Harshman. I'd like to acknowledge funding from the National Institute on Aging in the form of a KO-1, the Dana Foundation Program in Brain and Immunoimaging, and then several internal funding grants from the University of Iowa. Thank you very much.